I urge people to be very, very cautious of who they believe in. I think it is very dangerous and is very, very harmful to tell people in the community, sell your Bitcoin based on this power law that will be at this price or this price, or maybe this price, maybe this price, or this price at this time in the future. We can't tell you when, but maybe you should sell it then. I got into Bitcoin around 2012. Bitcoin is the best chance that we have at a fair financial system. If you have a price that can fit within a range from absolute zero and being so cold that it freezes anything in the universe to the center of our sun. Does that really tell you anything? That would be akin to a weather report saying that if you step outside, you'll instantaneously freeze, die, and shatter, or you'll vaporize. I'm not saying that we're going to hit 200,000, but I do think that we will have a very a green quarter four in the sense that October, November, December will be positive months. For the, for the very first time, spoke about the power law back in March. And any time since then, I've mentioned the power law, I get attacked by Giovanni, by others. If this model is so statistically valid, if it is so sound, if it is so profound, there would not be the need to attack. BlackRock and all the ETFs legitimize Bitcoin. Now we're experiencing a reality where we have institutional players coming in at size, and they're going to have far more impact on the, the market as a whole. This time, we have players, in my mind, that are actively incentivized to keep the market going up. And they're not doing it out of altruism, they're doing it because of greed. BlackRock gets more fees the higher Bitcoin goes. I'm really looking forward to today's topic with the Bitcoin Power Law, as we discussed before. Uh, I had already three people on that were really pro power law and they, they love the power law uh, and they really promote the power law even um and the other ones I, about the power law i talked a lot on my podcast but those three people were basically steven fred and um giovanni who really talked about it uh, before we get into the power law um because it's also your first podcast appearances as i understood it um why are you passionate about bitcoin what's your favorite thing about bitcoin and uh, some how do you see it generally uh um in in this year and, uh, and moving forward uh so when it comes to bitcoin i got into bitcoin around 2012 um i had heard about it before then and uh quite frankly i thought it was a scam <laughs> when i initially heard about it um i had um i was living in uh, st paul minnesota at the time and there were a few guys that I knew from college that had moved in a few blocks down. I just had to see them randomly. And they were um, moving in equipment to, to do a lot of mining. And they were doing a lot of stuff very, very early around two, at the end of 2011. And I didn't quite understand what they were doing. I didn't understand um, what it was. I didn't understand what um, anything about it really entailed. And they tried to tell me about it. But it didn't grasp at the time, right? So I missed my opportunity to get in very, very early in terms of when you can, you know, mine Bitcoin on a laptop or anything like that. Um, the first time I really dug into Bitcoin was 2012. Um, and that's when I really started to understand what it was. And at that time, I had a very, very, you know, a basic understanding of it. I knew it was a cryptocurrency. I knew it was digital money. I understood that it was a peer-to-peer -peer network. I read the white paper very, very briefly. So I had a general understanding. And um, then as the years went on and I started seeing um, the, the adoption slowly start to take up, that's when I really dug into it. And I started forming what I like to say are my own personal opinions that forms my general ethos around um, Bitcoin. So to give the most direct answer, I think that Bitcoin is the best chance that we have at a truly fa fair financial system, uh, a financial system that would run, you know, parallel to the traditional one, but one that does not um, function as a core, you know, tenant of its of its entire structure, that the basis currency that inflates currency away that takes your purchasing power away that essentially means that the, the more years you work you're working longer hours for money that is worth functionally less and i truly think that that by itself is such a powerful use case that it made me um very very passionate for what is possible with it and i've just been in the space ever since you know and i've, and I've ridden the waves and i've learned the lessons and I've sold when I shouldn't have. I've um, made decisions that I shouldn't have. So I've made all the mistakes. But um, 
throughout that entire process, I've just kind of gone deeper and deeper and deeper into Bitcoin. I've gotten into, you know, the elliptic curves. I've gotten into the hashing algorithm. I've gotten into um, the potential threats of quantum computing. I've, I've dug into so many topics on Bitcoin that I think it is it was going to do one of two things. It was going to make me more passionate or it was going to make me gradually disillusioned and I eventually got out of the space. So I kind of um, challenged myself to dig into a lot of the topics when it comes to both economy, when it comes to finance, when it comes to technology, and really make myself a well-versed, well-rounded person in the space. And when it comes to where I think things can go this year, um, you know, I've been posting for a few months now about the way Bitcoin typically behaves in um, election years during election cycles, and that the seasonality trends tend to be a little bit more pronounced um, in those times. And that's just another one of the ways where I've tried to have a more um, well-rounded view of Bitcoin. I'm not a trader. I don't do a lot of technical analysis, but I understand the value. And um, I'm not a person that ascribes to any one pattern, any one school of thought. But I do understand the value of understanding seasonality. I do understand the value of understanding macroeconomic trends. I understand the value of having an understanding of how political um, realities can influence Bitcoin. And with that said, I think this year we have everything kind of coalescing, right? We've got the BlackRock ETF. We've got, well, not just BlackRock, but we've got all the ETFs, right? We've got the election. We've got the um, reality that, you know, they've had rising interest rates for a while that eventually stopped and tapered off and tapered off and didn't rise. And now we're getting to the point where, you know, the rates are going to drop again, right? 25 basis points, 50 basis points, whatever, what have you. I think that all of these factors are coalescing and creating a lot of pressure on Bitcoin. But I don't think that pressure is necessarily negative. I think that pressure is just the reality of Bitcoin evolving as a financial asset. So in my mind, BlackRock and all the ETFs legitimize Bitcoin. Now we're, we're experiencing a reality where we have institutional players coming in at size and they're going to have far more impact on the, the market as a whole. You know, we've got um, states like Wisconsin and a few others um, adding into the pension fund. We've obviously got MicroStrategy and Michael Saylor. We've got Semler Scientific. We've got DeFi Technologies. We've got um, Fold. We've got so many things coalescing now. Oh, Michael Dell. Dell might even... Um, adopt Bitcoin, right? That's the, that's the big one, right? So that everyone is just saying, oh, wow, if that happens, then the floodgates open. So there's so many things that are impacting Bitcoin right now that I think what helps me make sense of it is that when things are very, very complex, I try to take them and whittle them down. And I create what I call a decision pair that forces me to say either or. So it is either Bitcoin is going to go up or it's going to go down. I think it's going to go up. Okay, fine. What are the factors that are going to mitigate that? Seasonality is definitely a factor. I think that we are following the seasonality trend very, very tightly this year in this election cycle. I do believe that what we are seeing right now in terms of the market sell-off, first we had the yen carry trade a few weeks back that caused you know that really deep sell-off. And now we have the looming rate cuts. I think what we saw um, these last two days was the market reacting to the potential for the rate cuts and the market, um, I think, front running the rate cut. So what I mean by that is rate cuts imply cheaper capital for corporations to borrow to buy more assets. Therefore, it is in their interest to sell off and to, to suppress, suppress the price as much as possible so that when the rate cuts come in and liquidity comes back into the market, they can ride that wave back up. I'm a firm believer that market makers and institutional players and whatnot definitely influence the market heavily. And I think that's what we're seeing now. That's really interesting. A uh, really good point. Uh, some questions around that I have. Um, you said in the beginning that uh, we're building a parallel system with uh, not, uh, not the disadvantages of the fiat system. Do you see at some point the parallel system, Bitcoin, replacing the, the fiat system? Replacing entirely, no. And I say that for a few reasons for, and let's just talk it through. Let, let's say Bitcoin does replace the system, right? Let, let's talk that through. So we have hyper Bitcoinization, right? We have Bitcoin being the base layer for money. We have Bitcoin being the, the primary medium of exchange and so on and so forth. Um, 
I don't know if that ever was truly feasible, simply because we have a lot of limitations on the base layer that will require a lot of layer two solutions. And you know, that's where all coins come in and so on and so forth. We don't need to get into all of that. Um, I firmly believe, and this is just based on, um, you know, some things that Hal Finney said um, early on in Bitcoin's days, where he saw a future where you had, you know, custodians and um, person to person like you and me doing Bitcoin transactions would be very, very rare. I do think that is the most likely model. I think Bitcoin is likely to follow a gold 2.0. So you have Bitcoin operating as the base layer of money, as the base layer of the currency. And we have monies that are issued against that. The um, difference in the model in, in this case, where I, I don't think Bitcoin will replace necessarily completely, as in do away with fiat currencies, is because the fiat currencies are going to be issued with Bitcoin backing them, right? And then I do see a future where stable coins are really, really key and central to the global economy. And with that said, you then have the reality of stable coins being issued in either USD and Canadian dollars and Chinese dollars, what have you. And they can operate on a variety of technologies. I think they'll be faster. I think they will be um, more ubiquitous in a sense that we will no longer have to wait, you know, two business days to send large wire transactions from one side of the world to the next. I do think that um, that will cause a pressure on banks for maintaining their current structure in the sense that if you have instantaneous settlements of money and if you have your 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 dollars operating on, I don't know, a facsimile of a blockchain in the sense that you understand what the, the out, outputs and inputs are at all times, it then becomes very, very hard to charge things like overdraft fees. And it becomes very, very hard to charge, um, you know, the traditional fee structure that we see in banking now. So I think it's going to cause a lot of fundamental changes. And ironically enough, I, I believe that um, the reality of Bitcoin is that in a, in a gold 2.0 model, it ironically creates a more perfect fiat system in the sense that if it's gold 2.0 and you have this completely pristine, immutable, traceable asset as the base layer, having fiat currencies issued off of that, I think they inherit some of those qualities, not, not being pristine, but they inherit the stability that Bitcoin brings. And I think it will create a financial system that's far more stable. That's an interesting viewpoint. Um, it's also interesting for me because like one thing is for sure, and nobody will disagree with that. You will never be able to buy on the base layer of Bitcoin something uh, for for everyday things. Like, of course, you can buy something with it, uh, but you can even now do something. Even now, I, for example, <laughs> sell my sponsorships on base layer Bitcoin. Like I accept directly in Bitcoin payments, but that's because the fees are not crazy uh, and, and uh, it, it's possible. So, but if we're talking about a scenario where everyone is on Bitcoin in this hyper-Bitcoinized world, that's just not possible because the base layer has, has limitations. So if we even come there, uh, we need layer two solutions. We need maybe on layer two solutions, even other layers. Maybe we need layer two solutions that work together with other layer two solutions. Like there's a lot of technicalities involved. And then the question becomes, is that already feared? <laughs> if, if Is a layer two or layer three um, already uh, to a certain extent, um, like how, how much, because the, the more you go up with layers, the, the less security obviously you have and the more mm -hmm. are the chances of maybe someone gives you one Bitcoin, even though he only has half a Bitcoin. So like uh, the more you go up, it, the, the higher the chances of that is. So it's interesting to, to think about how a future system could work uh, when maybe we need a layer free and the layer free uh, is a little bit like a banking Bitcoin uh, where you have to trust a third party, but you always have the, the, the possibility to go down. So Bitcoin kind of creates this exit valve for fiat. Like maybe we have a new fiat system, but there's always this exit valve. Is, is, is that how you, how you see it all with stable coins on, on, on Bitcoin or did I... So, and let's, let's talk through some more specifics here. So one of the reasons why I don't see Bitcoin 
um, taking over and becoming the, the primary un unit of currency. For the issues that you mentioned, yes, speed, transferability, all of those are very, very real limitations. Here's another limitation that I think, or another reality perhaps, that people have not given enough thought. No sovereign nation is going to give over their currency to a decentralized blockchain. What, what incentive would they have to do that? You, have an, you would have an entire nation saying that our money is now dependent upon hash rates, it is now dependent upon Bitcoin miners, it is now dependent upon all of these external factors. That makes sense at the individual level. I don't know if that makes sense at the nation state level. I think at the nation state level, it makes more sense to have Bitcoin as a pristine reserve asset that they can use to buttress their own system. That, that is one of the distinct um, factors, I think, that needs more thought. So with that said, if you have a fiat currency and you have a stable coin, stable coins are issued as facsimile to fiat, right? One dollar for one um, USDC, okay? So with that said, in my mind, the fiat system and the stable coin system would operate in tandem with that Bitcoin system. So in the sense that if you have a bank and let's say they have $20 billion in Bitcoin, they would have $20 billion in stablecoin, right? They would have a match, a one for one match with regards to the um, Bitcoin that they have on the, on the balance sheet and the Bitcoin and, and the stablecoin that they can issue. So before that can happen, obviously Bitcoin has to stabilize more. We can't have the volatility that we see now. So this is still a ways off in the future. But at a very, very high conceptual level, because this is not going into the details, if we have a system where you have custodians, if you have nation states issuing stable coins against their Bitcoin, that is what I mean by a parallel system. I, I think that we would slowly but surely move away from fiat being issued in the, in the traditional sense where you can debase it, you can um, have fractional reserves against it, so on and so forth. I do think that Bitcoin can create the impetus to create, could create the directive to have a more pristine, well-structured, auditable, fair, extensible in the sense that it will be faster, it will be more efficient financial system. But we need to have a parallel to do that first. We're, we cannot move from one to the other without having both. And I think that we can, we can slowly move to Bitcoin being that base layer and then having stable coins issued against it. And in my mind, that's not a fiat relationship. In my mind, that is simply them saying we have our denominated money. We understand what the exchange rates are. We are now saying that we have a stable coin issued against that. And then we are backing that stable coin in um, tandem with Bitcoin, having that, having that backing for the stable coin. And we'll slowly but surely move away from having the fiat currency that's backed by nothing. So this backing is still variable or would you like say like they, they make it one to one or something like that? It can depend, really. This is something that I'm still trying to figure out on my, on my own, that I'm still trying to say what makes the most sense. But if we use um, the U.S. as an example, and let's say right now, you know, Senator Loomis is, is successful and we start, you know, accumulating a lot of Bitcoin and having a treasury, right? How does that work? It, are we now saying that, okay, the U.S. dollar is backed by Bitcoin? Okay, but in what, in what measure? In what extent? 5%? 1%? Uh, half of a percent? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that that works necessarily very, very easily. However, if the United States says we have Bitcoin on our balance sheet, it has this denominated dollar value. Thus, we now have the ability to have stable coins issued against Bitcoin, a different, almost a different currency against Bitcoin that can perhaps, you know, gain better interest that can perhaps, I don't know, maybe it'll back treasury bills. There's all kinds of ways that I think Bitcoin can be leveraged at the nation state level um, that will allow it to be one-to-one -one backed, like you're suggesting, that it could have backing for treasury bills, that can have the backing for stable coins. There, there's many, many layers to it. I don't know if it's just going to be one-to-one. -one. I think there's going to be many, many factors that play into it just because of the way the system works right now. I think it will cause too much um, disruption to 
to try to just mimic what what we have in the fiat world on Bitcoin. But if we have stable coins, if we have a separate system, if we have stable coins, we have treasury bills, we have et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, backed by Bitcoin, I, that's what I mean by the parallel system. And in time, I think that parallel system will take over. But even even when it takes over, we're still going to have a um, fiatization of some of the aspects in the sense that we are issuing stablecoin backed by Bitcoin, just as dollars were issued backed by um, backed by gold, right? So that aspect of issuing notes on it, I think, is still the only factor that exists. But we're not going to have fiat in the sense that this will be backed by nothing. We'll issue the dot. We will issue the stablecoin. The fiatization of of it in the sense of issuing notes will persist. We might have leveraged lending. We might have some banks that do have a fractional reserve. We might have certain aspects of the fiat system that persist, but I think it'll still be a more stable system. I definitely see also the transition period being exactly like you described it. Like we we cannot switch. Like I I don't think, and I actually hope that that's not the case. I I, I truly hope that we have for a long period of time like a hybrid system where Bitcoin is gaining on, on dominance and, and fiat is slowly, slowly decreasing on dominance because right now it's like 99% fiat and like 0.1% Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin, we, we should not kid ourselves. Bitcoin is still a very small player oh, in the, in the very, global very things. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, sometimes, sometimes I feel like people describe bitcoin uh, bigger as bitcoin as big as it's all uh, as it actually is um the only thing like if i talk if i think really long term out and i think like bitcoin is so obvious where you can pay in stores with it like i mean there are already some stores that accept bitcoin it's not really far stretch but even in vienna in my city for example i go to a, a local meetup there you can pay with lightning even you get even a 10 percent discount if you pay with lightning uh, then there's Lugano, obviously, where you can basically pay almost everything in the city in Switzerland, where uh, uh, everything in Bitcoin already. So, like that, that, that kind of surprises me that those places already exist, even though it's very small and limited. Um, but if we come to that place where Bitcoin is almost everywhere accepted, uh, and it's technically possible to hold Bitcoin on a layer two, layer three, whatever uh, innovation that I think is not there yet, but maybe it will be there. I have a hard time uh, understanding why people should hold something that, and, and basically an IOU on, on Bitcoin where the government says like, oh, we are backing Bitcoin. Because the thing with gold, gold was like hard to carry and you had to, it's hard to devise, mm -hmm. but Bitcoin is not all those things. Like Bitcoin, you can divide Bitcoin uh, as, as much as you want. It's digital. Uh, you can carry it around. You can even carry it in your head. So. In a, in a very late stage, and we are talking like probably hundreds of years out. So like that's that's something that I probably don't uh, see. Maybe it happens faster. The timing is always really hard for me. Uh, but then I have a hard time believing that an IOU on Bitcoin, basically, where like a stablecoin is issued one to one to Bitcoin, is something that people will hold because they're like, oh, why, why should I not hold the direct Bitcoin? But <laughs> people still hold IOUs most of the times. People hold Bitcoin on exchange. That's an IOU. That's not Bitcoin. So, 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 yeah, until so they take off the exchange, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's kind of the, the counter to my own argument where I'm like, yeah, most people hold their Bitcoin on exchange. Most people hold on ETF. Like m only a small portion of people hold actually their, their own Bitcoin. But sorry for my a small rant. I like, just wanted to get that. Oh, no. Get that thought out that, no, that's actually very, very perfect. Here's why. So... Let's use that example you just brought up, right? So, and let's think about it from a few different ways. On the gold standard, every dollar that was issued was essentially you saying that this is a proportionate value of gold, right? So in a way it's an IOU, but it was as good as gold. You can go at certain, at certain points in history, you can go and exchange your dollars for gold, right? Okay. So now let's think of it in terms of um, Bitcoin. How would that look if a bank country, what have you, has Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Can I then say, me as an individual citizen, I have $100 in whatever stable coin that is backed by um, Bitcoin. 
and I go into a bank and say, I want you to give me the equal proportion of Bitcoin and send it to my cold wallet, I don't know. Will there be banks that perhaps want to cater to that model? Perhaps. But this is where um, I, all of those you know, political realities that I mentioned about nation states come into play. If you take a look at um, Custodia Bank, for instance, with um, Caitlin Long, she's tried to have a 100% reserve bank, right? But she is facing all sorts of regulatory challenges with that. Now, intuitively, that doesn't make sense. Why would you want to prevent a fully backed bank from existing? What, what potential threat does that pose, right? And that will take us down a whole other rabbit hole. But we have a reality where there is a system that exists on fractional reserve that will have issues adapting to and accepting a reality where there is a pristine asset at the base layer that cannot be debased away. And that in theory, if you were to try to do a fractionalized lending on it, you would very, very quickly run into problems, right? So we saw what happened with BlockFi, with Celsius, with Three Hours Capital. All of those players were, were doing those traditional fiat games on Bitcoin. They were playing games of Bitcoin that they didn't have. And once someone became insolvent very quickly, everything went up, right? And this is where um, I'm still trying to refine my thought process on how I think it can go. Because in your example, it is, a, is the stable coin an IOU or is the stable coin truly this $100 of USDC is worth $100 of Bitcoin at whatever exchange rate there is? That I think is a very, very important question. If, if we are operating on a true, in my mind, in my opinion, gold standard 2.0, if I have $1,000 in a stable coin, I should go to the bank or go online and say, I'm, I'm exchanging this stable coin for the equal value of Bitcoin, right? If it is a, and this is what I meant by a slight fiatization of the model, I do see where we can have a system. And again, this is going to be a transition, right? I think nations will transition to a more pristine system, but initially we would have a system where you do have IOUs, where you do have a, re a situation where you have Bitcoin on the balance sheet and the bank, whomever, is saying that this pristine asset is helping us buttress our, our reserves and we are now issuing money based on our total reserves. What if they have Bitcoin? What if they have gold, palladium, other precious metals? What if they have treasury bonds? What if they have a blended asset base? And they're issuing stable coins to that, right? For the speed and the ubiquity of stable coins. Um, what, what if they have a model where they are like a custodian bank where they're 100% um, backed by Bitcoin? Whatever Bitcoin they have on their balance sheet, that is how much Bitcoin that they have to um, operate off of. How does that look? But, you know, there's so many things that I think that still need to be figured out. And I think we are so very, very early because as you just mentioned, Bitcoin is still very, a very, very small player. And I think people really don't understand just how small. If you take the global market in terms of cash, derivatives, um, so on and so forth, we're in the quadrillions of dollars. <laughs> Bitcoin is nowhere near um, the size to appreciably dent that market just yet, right? We've got so far yet to go. And I do think that um, we will get there through a variety of means. And because of that, because the, the fiat system is so, I don't want to use the word entangled, but it really, really is. You know, you have $1 being used a variety of ways. The, the, the system just isn't ready for a Bitcoin standard, right? We're, we're nowhere near ready for it. And as we slowly move towards it, I, this is why I think we're going to have to have a compromise in our expectations as Bitcoiners, where we can't expect them to like flip a switch and just go from you know zero to one hundred in the span of ten years. There's going to need to be a transition period, and in that transition period, there are going to be things that some people like, like IOUs, and some people don't like, like um, the fact that that IOU is a fractional reserved version of Bitcoin, um, or that. Your ETF, perhaps, is a 
is that that's an IOU as, as well, right? We, I don't own the ETF. My father does, right? But my father's also 80 years old and he doesn't quite grasp, you know, wallets and seed phrases and so on and so on and so forth. So there's going to have to be compromise. That's so interesting. Really, really cool. Um, the second question that I had from from your first first uh, uh, question answered uh, was around the seasonality of Bitcoin right now. So, like, let's let's go back to the where, where Bitcoin is right now, and then uh, then do the power law. Um, for me, it's really interesting what this year happened. For the first time ever, we have uh, Bitcoin ETFs in the US. In other countries, we already had it. For the first time ever, we have we broke the all-time high before the halving. Uh, and uh, it seems like we have all the buckets that there should be. Like we have the Bitcoin ETF bucket. We have nation states of El Salvador even though it's a small nation state, but we have a nation state. We have obviously publicly traded company with MicroStrategy. And I think now like 100 other publicly traded company that is doing that, maybe even hundreds. I don't know of the, the exact number, how many uh, publicly traded companies with all the mining stocks and all, all that uh, in Bitcoin already. Um, so it feels like we have all the the buckets and all the, the things that we need for a mass adoption uh, there we laid the groundwork. Now my question is like, will that cycle, will that season of Bitcoin, because of all the reasons that I just laid out, maybe also because of election, maybe we get a Trump administration with RFK in there, uh, with with Loomis in there that's saying like, oh, we have to buy Bitcoin. Um, if, if everything plays out really positively, do you think we can go into like a 10-year gold rush era for, for Bitcoin. Uh, do, you, do you see some, some possibility uh, around that? Yeah, I do. So let's, let's think it through. So with regards to um, seasonality, the, at a very, very high level, seasonality is just simply saying that assets, stocks, what have you, follow a certain trend at certain months at certain times of the year. Um, and the trend has held up throughout um, the seasons and throughout history. And then they give you statistics based on that, right? So if we think about it in terms of first the seasonality um, aspect, the general trend, um, and I'm sure people have heard this before, like in the markets, you know, sell in May and go away, right? That, that's a play on seasonality in the sense that you're saying that in May, typically is the best time to sell because summer months are kind of mm, when it comes to price action, and then it kicks up against in the fall, right? And if we look at this past summer, we had June, that was so-so. We had July, that was good. It was a very green month. Now we're in August, and we were in August, sorry, and now we're in September, right? August and September typically are very, very down months. Now, the, the trend um, broke somewhat last year in the sense that September was a green month. But overall, the trend is that August and September are lower months, right? And um, like I mentioned, if you take a look at seasonality data during election years, there is evidence to say that that trend is more pronounced. So whatever trends exist are more pronounced in election years for a wide variety of reasons that are well outside the scope of this conversation. So with that said, with um, some of the points that you are mentioning, let's also remember, you know, we have rate cuts. We have the fact that we had higher rate cuts. We had so many, sorry, not higher rate cuts. We had higher rates and now we're having rate cuts. And we have, um, you know, a situation where we had the yen carry trade. We had, I, I hope this doesn't get flagged on YouTube for me saying it. We had a, you know what, with Donald Trump almost happened, right? That, that could have been a tremendous black swan event. Um, now we no longer have Joe Biden running for president. We now have Kamala Harris. There have been so many changes this year. That if we really sit down and think about it for Bitcoin, we have ETFs. We had almost, you know what, with Donald Trump. We have one president deciding not to run. We have another new potential president that is now running that has a chance to win. We have presidential candidates that were talking about putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet, talking about Bitcoin mining. We have, of course, still Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy. We have, this, we have similar scientific. We have all of these factors going in. So how do I think that plays into your question? I do think it's possible 
that we see a prolonged trend for Bitcoin tapering up, but I do not think it's going to be as violent as people anticipate. And I say that for a few reasons. If we have, um, let's use quarter four as an example here, just very, very briefly, because I think that quarter four this year is going to be good. I'm not saying that we're going to hit 200,000, but I do think that we will have a very a green quarter four in the sense that October, November, December will be positive months. Let's say Bitcoin goes up to 100,000, right? Proportionally, we're going to need a lot more capital in the market to push it that high, right? The higher we go, the more capital we need to keep pushing higher. Now, there are multiples that come into play during a bull market that are very, very hard to predict. So I'm going to put those to the side for now and just talk about it in terms of what is possible versus what is probable. It is possible that we have a very green um, quarter four. I think it is also probable. I think that we can possibly hit 100,000 before the year is out. If I'm being more, um, I don't want to say realistic or I'm not being bearish, if I can be more cautious, I would say that 85,000 to 100,000 is a nice range for the end of the year. Let's say we get there, then what happens? We have the election coming up in November. How does that play in? I think if Trump wins, by and large, the expectation is that the markets are going to be very green, right? Because he would likely, again, assuming that he holds true to what he's been saying, be a Bitcoin advocate in the White House. He would, you know, likely start um, printing money more quickly under the impetus of we have to stimulate the economy, right? Because he, because I can see a situation where it goes from, oh, we have too much debt and inflation is too high to, oh my God, what if hypothetically he says, let's print money and buy Bitcoin, right? Is that possible? Sure. Is it probable? No. Let's say it's possible. So yes, it's possible that it happens. It's very, very possible that it goes to 150,000 to 200,000 in 2025. And then we have another 80% correction, right? And then we're waiting for the next, the next halving and the next bull run. That is all very, very possible. If Kamala Harris wins, I think the general sentiment is that the market is unsure. I'm not a person that's going to say that because she's a Democrat or because of her political views, the market's going to assume that it's going to go a certain way and then just drop right down, right? I think the markets and the market makers and the players in the market are going to be more um, structured in their, their response. And I think they're trying to feel her out. So when she wins, do I think it's, or not when she wins, if she wins, do I think that when that happens, there will be a likelihood of a market sell-off that is possible? Yes, I think it's also probable just because the market is, is feeling her out. But in either case, with Trump or Harris, long term, my thesis is that Bitcoin is slowly going to taper up. We're not going to go from 60,000 to 250, but can we go from 55 to 85 to 100 and then to 120? And then kind of stay there for a very, very long period of time throughout 2025. I think that's, that's, I think that's more probable than people want to admit simply because once we get to that level, it is going to take a lot more capital to move the market. Um, once that happens, we also have a psychological factor in the markets where I think that hundred thousand dollar level is a very, very strong psychological level. When that happens, we are just as likely to see it pop up and stay at 120 as we are to see it drop right back down to 70 because a lot of longtime holders are thinking, oh, $100,000 is hit. We've hit that mark. It's time for me to sell. It's I've made 50 to 1,000x from holding from God knows when, right? There are so many factors that can come into play. But if you look at the gold ETFs and what happened with gold, it, it essentially wasn't a long bull run. And I do think we're going to, we can see that. And I do think there's going to be ebbs and flows, but in my mind, I think it is more likely that we hit 2028 and be hovering around $120,000 and that we've been hovering around $120,000 for a very, very long time than it is we crashed all the way down to 30 
and then had to build all the way back up. In understanding that, of course, if Black Swan events happened, that changes everything because no one knows what happened then. But assuming things take this trend uh, and we have the institutionalization, I think that Bitcoin will become a more stable asset with time. Interesting. Um, 120,000 in, in 2028, you said? Yeah, I think that whatever peak price we hit in this cycle, if we do have a correction, I do. I can see us correcting in, into the 100,000 range. I really do. I think that we can go up to like 100, 120 and then maybe have a peak and then come back down. But we'll be ranging around $100,000 for a very, very long while. I can see that happening. Oh, also you're saying the the deepest drop in the next cycle uh, will then like 120,000. Yeah, I, I, I think it's very possible that we no longer see those 80% drawdowns. Um, so it's going to be proportional, right? So if we if the height is 120, for, at the very, very peak for this cycle is 120,000, can we drop back down to 70 and stay there for like three years? Yes. If the peak of this cycle is 200,000 or 180,000, can we drop back down to 100 to 120,000 and stay there for a very, very, very long time? Yes. Because again, the more you need more money to move the market once you get to these levels. And I think that we are reaching a point where there's only going to be so much selling pressure you can constantly put on Bitcoin, right? A lot of that happens from the futures market. A lot of that happens for a variety of reasons. But as more players come in, you do have game theory that plays in, right? And as more players come in, there's more Bitcoin being taken off the exchanges. There's more Bitcoin being taken um, directly for miners. There, there's so many factors that come into Bitcoin becoming more scarce and higher in price than us seeing that drop that just puts us down into the doldrums for, for a year and a half to two years. So that, that is, that's my thesis. I think that we can have more boring price action than we think. It's going to go up, it'll come down, and then it'll just stay there. <laughs> it'll trend. And I think that that will actually piss off more people than we think. And it'll get more people um, out of the market, but it'll also get more people into the market. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet. And I have one for you here. This is the Bitcoin only edition from the Bitbox, my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market. Another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase. And Bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase. They made a reusable steel wallet. Check out that beauty. It's durable and extremely heavy. If I put it on the desk, I seriously fear for my own table. It's so, so heavy and durable. I love it. This is where my seed phrase is secure. Go to bitbox.swiss robin to get your bitbox. And if you use code robin, you even get 5% off of your complete order. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You you have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first 
ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Really interesting. Uh, I want to get one more time a little bit on this 100k trigger point because I think it it will be 100k is such a number which will get everyone talking. Like th mm -hmm. that's that's because I think like 100k. The next time we will see it is a one million, but like the 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 last time we saw it was probably like 10k. Uh, and before that was probably like one dollar or something like that. So like th those are like some of my psychology uh, milestones. And I think 100k could either, as you said, like have this effect of like oh long term hodler selling a little bit off and saying like oh, okay it's it it, uh, it it I have made a good profit. But what I also can see with the 100k uh, is a big jump up. Uh, as we saw it a little bit with the 10k where we then really quickly i think we ran up to like 17k or something like that so uh, for yeah. me it's, yeah. i think it's not unrealistic to think of like if we hit the 100k we maybe run up to like 180k and then fall back down to the, whatever the the fall back uh, down is i think uh, after the 17k we fell back down like a lot i think Free, free for us or something like that even uh the really low level so it's interesting of that level because this is a level where every news outlet like like the complete mainstream news outlet that never covered bitcoin they will cover bitcoin when it hits 100k so i feel like that's that's a major psychology uh, uh trigger point um do, do you think that could uh like you covered first that like it could cover like a uh, drop to like 70k down and something like that do you think it could actually also trigger something in the upside as as we had it with the 10 so yeah i think that i think that does line up with what i'm saying relatively with a few differences and let's touch on those so to your point absolutely it is a major psychological level i think that once we even with me, I've been in the market for so long and I've seen so many gyrations. And I can tell you that if when I see Bitcoin hit $100,000, even I will say to myself, holy shit, it finally happened, right? Now, granted, I have assumed it was going to happen and I th I've thought it was going to happen and I've acted as if it would, would, go, would happen, which is why I've been, which is why I accumulated Bitcoin so heavy. And this is why I've still to this day accumulate Bitcoin. But when it happens, that is going to be like a, whoa. It's going to be a shock to the market, I think, right? So with that said, in your example, you, you brought up all the, all the points I think that are very, very valid. News outlets are going to cover it. It's going to be, it'll be global news, I think. I think we would have a likelihood of potential FOMO. There will be new players that come into the market at that point that buy that $100,000 level thinking it's going to go to 200, 300, you know, so on and so forth. In that case, I can see it still um, playing out the way I think, because let's say it does follow that. We hit 100,000, everyone goes wild, we just go and we shoot up to like 150, 180, something, something like that, right? Even in that event where we do that and we sell off, I, I'm having a hard time with the, with the current market being what it is, with the ETFs, with the potential adoption from nation states with, you know, all the players in the market, I'm having a hard time seeing where we have that violent sell-off, right? Because in, in like, um, in the 2020 run, when we hit 60, or sorry, in the 2021 and in 21, when we hit 60,000 and then we dropped by, back down, that was a very precipitous sell-off, right? And then we hit it again and we dropped back down again, right? And then if we go all the way back to 2016 and we go about and 2016 and 2017, we went from like 1000 to 3000 to, to 19,000. And then we sold off, right? What people don't mention, I think is the fact that in 2017, we had the futures launch right around the time Bitcoin hit that all time high futures. And in, in my opinion, are tools to manipulate the market. Once the CME, CME, that CME futures launched, the price crashed, okay? Let's fast forward to 2021. 
who was in the market in 2021? Sam Bankman Freed, BlockFi, Celsius, Three Hours Capital, all of these players that were playing leverage games on Bitcoin that created an extreme instability in the system. And in my mind, kept us back. We should have crossed 100,000 last run because we had fiscal stimulus. We had quantitative easing. We had a, we had a, a um, captive audience with COVID. No one was going out, right? We had Wall Street bets. We had all of these different factors going in where people were just looking for something to buy, looking for something to do. And that's why the price shot up so quickly and, and why the, the returns were so crazy. But they were capped off because we had players that were actively betting against the market and actively pushing the market down. This time... We have players, in my mind, that are actively incentivized to keep the market going up. And they're not doing it out of altruism. They're doing it because of greed. BlackRock gets more fees the higher Bitcoin goes. All of these ETF players get more fees the higher Bitcoin goes. All of these other players that are buying Bitcoin benefit from Bitcoin staying higher up. So and that's why I say, even in the event where we have that crazy FOMO buy to 180000 and we do come back down, the violent drop, I think, becomes less likely because of the kind of players we have in the market. We have players that benefit from Bitcoin going higher, right? And say what you want about traditional market players, say what you want about BlackRock. Once they got into the foray, and once they are now players in the market, it, it benefits them for Bitcoin to just live and die by number go up. So once we go up and we come back down, I don't, I don't see it happening. I do not see us going back down to 30,000 from 180. I see us perhaps going to 80,000 and trending along that way. Or let's try this as an example. Here's another way of thinking of it. I see us using the last all time high. So let's say it's about 70,000, right? So from the last cycle to, what we saw this cycle before the halving, let's just round it up to 70,000. I can see 70,000 being the floor for the next cycle, right? And I can see us trending there for a very, 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 very long time into the next cycle. Unless there's a global event, a war, something, and when I say a war, I mean a true large scale war, a true, um, you know, black swan economic event. I don't see us going down further. But even in the case of a war, if you look at historically, gold and other precious metals and other precious assets did well during wartime. So we can see us drop below 70, but I, then I can see us popping back up. I'm, And this is not me being optimistic. This is just me trying to say what is possible versus what is probable. Is it, is it possible that we slam all the way back down again as usual before? Yes. Is it probable? I don't think so. We have entirely different market dynamics now. We have an entirely different set of players. Um, we have an entirely different level of volume that those players can bring to the market. So I, I just think that the um, reality of it is fundamentally different now. Wow, really cool. I, I can't believe that you have never been on a podcast <laughs> before because you're doing an amazing job. Uh, really, really cool. Thank you. I for appreciate all. that. Thank you. Thank you for choosing my, my podcast as the first one. I feel always honored. Um, now let's get to, into after over 50 minutes into this topic that we wanted to get early in, but it was so interesting. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Um, the Bitcoin power law. I had uh, just uh, uh, to clarify, I had three people already on. Uh, as you know, I had Giovanni on, I had Steve on, I had uh, Fred Kruger on, uh, and all those three people were amazing guests. They, they, they laid out their cases really, really nicely. I am not a mathematician, like I have no clue about math uh, other than what you learn in, in school. Um, so my way of analyzing the Bitcoin power law is, is limited to what I'm saying, like, the, the only critique I always have to it is like, you should not trade based on the Bitcoin power law. That's like, that's what I always try to get, get people to, to understand. Like uh, every model can be broken to some extent. So it's, it's like, I, it, what happens if you sell off a little bit of your Bitcoin and on the next day, Apple decides to put 50% of their treasury in Bitcoin. 
not likely but possible and then you, <laughs> you never go back down to your level mm -hmm. uh, like there, there's always that, that possibility so like i i would never sell bitcoin if you're doing a weighted dca maybe it's interesting uh but but i'm not interested in that either so what's your uh thoughts on the bitcoin power law uh what are some like the good things and the bad things and the ugly things that you see okay so let's see here I'm going to try to be as respectful and as objective as possible when talking about the Bitcoin power law. And I say that because every time on Twitter that I've talked about it, I have gotten completely attacked, completely attacked by certain individuals. And I've gotten um, my DMs blown up by all kinds of random people on Twitter telling me all kinds of horrible things about how stupid I am, right? So I'm going to try to do this in a way that um, speaks true to my personality and to the way I do things. I'm going to try to not talk to you or talk at you, but talk with you about the concepts of the power law. And we're going to keep things very, very conceptual because you said you're not a mathematician, but I do not think that you need to be a mathematician to accurately assess the usefulness or the validity of a particular model. So here, here's why I say that. Let's look at this concept by concept. We have first the, the principle of what a power law is. A lot of people get caught up in the name power law. It is, it is not saying it is a law as, as, as is a gravity is a law, right? It's not, that's not what it's saying. A power law is a mathematical relationship. Okay. That's the way to think of it. And that mathematical relationship is on a logarithmic scale. And the way to think of a log logarithmic scale is if you just say 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million, so on and so on and so forth. Just think of it in that way. Follow base 10. So it goes 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Okay. So that by the time you get to um, logs, I think what was it, log six, you're at a million or something like that. Um, with that said, what that means is these ranges are very, very wide, okay? Now, having the wide range is useful in the sense that if you are visualizing data, and when I say visualizing, you're putting it on a graph, right? If you have a data set, let's say, like Bitcoin, that has a price that started off at 0.0000, 0 9 cents, and that has a peak of like, you know, 73,000, it would allow you when you're looking at historical data to have a very nice line that shows a gradual progression upward, right? It, it does visualize rather beautifully. If you take historical data and you put it on a log log scale and you then chart it out, you do see a very clear relationship, right? So that by itself is very attractive. Human beings are visual creatures, right? We like to conceptualize things. So intuitively, when we see this and we put the Bitcoin data on this log log scale or even a log scale, and that's time and price or just price, and we see this line, it is very easy to say, this is a very clear relationship that's showing the, the number trending upward. And yes, there's peaks and there's troughs, of course, but the general trend is number go up, right? Okay. What does that even mean? You often hear proponents of the power law talk about orders of magnitude. The Bitcoin price has followed a power law within X orders of magnitude. One, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. Okay. To give you an idea of what six orders of magnitude is, that is the difference between absolute zero, which is the coldest known temperature in the known universe, and the core of our sun, which is several, I forget the exact number, but it's like several thousand degrees in temperature, right? So with that said, the first question I'll ask you, because remember I said I want this to be a interactive ex um, conversation. If you have a price that can fit within a range from absolute zero and, and being so cold that it freezes anything in the universe, to the center of our sun, does that really tell you anything? No. <laughs> okay. 
And why do you say that? Because, um, so like the, the range is too big. It's, it's like saying like, oh yeah, like tomorrow, if, if I ask like, oh, will it rain uh, next uh, week on a Tuesday? Uh, for me, it's like, it, it's like saying, yeah, it, it could be really catastrophic. It could rain extremely heavily. It could be, I don't know what the word is for like the, the solid things that can rain. I'm not a, a native English speaker, pale. but it could pale. Yeah, it could uh, pale. It pale, could really yes. uh, heavily r rain or it could not rain at all. And it could be a really sunny day and you don't need to worry. Uh, so it, it's, it's like, um, if you want to predict something, if you have the, the, thing of like, I want to get to a point where I know what's happening in the future, giving such a wide range seems for me uh, something like, oh, why do I get a range at all? Maybe the average says me something, like maybe the, the average of something uh, is, is something that is insightful. But the interesting thing is like, if you have the two extremes, the, the, the average will be always in the middle. And what is the middle uh, of that? So that's, that's an interesting thought of like, uh, is what, what is the middle of, of, of the ho hottest, uh, point in the sun? Uh, and what's the, uh, call is like, what, what's the middle of that? It's a, it's a normal sunny day or like, what, what is that? So that's why I said, it doesn't give me any insight if you give me such a wide range. So yes, and your example is, is perfect, but here's a more succinct to the point example. That would be akin to a weather report saying that if you step outside, you'll instantaneously freeze, die, and shatter, or you'll vaporize. So that that is basically what it's saying. Do you want to instantaneously freeze, blow blow to dust and shatter, or do you want to burst into flames and be reduced to atoms? That that is the range that is operating off of. Okay. So that's the first problem. Very very conceptually, the ranges are too wide to be even remotely useful. They are claiming a predictive model. Okay. Tell me what Bitcoin is going to be next week. Tell me what Bitcoin is going to be a month from now. Tell me what big for, for give me anything. Tell me big what Bitcoin's price is going to be with real, reliable certainty within one week, one month, six months, what have you. Don't give me a range uh, that is cartoonishly wide and tell me Bitcoin is going to fall within this range. That's not telling you anything. That is not very very useful. That is not a very very helpful data point. Which comes to one of my main criticisms. This model is not predictive. What it is, is descriptive. It is describing a historical relationship of Bitcoin's price data. And I say that because what is the only data that they can use to operate off of? It has to be looking in the past. We do not know Bitcoin's price tomorrow or next week. So we have to look into the past for that data, right? And with that, again, very, very conceptually high level, you run into a few pro potential problems. Okay. So you have, you're looking back in time, which means that you run into the potential for hindsight bias, which means that again, human beings are very, very visual pattern recognizing machines. You have an innate bias to say, I am now looking at this data on this logarithmic scale. It must mean something. And you're looking at data that is, is historical, which means it is auto-correlated and sense that. And the way to think of that is one data point is, is dependent upon the data point that preceded it. So obviously the price of Bitcoin on a Tuesday in 2010 would have impact and relation to the price of Bitcoin on a Wednesday, that following Wednesday in 2010. That's a very, very simplified example but I'm just trying to give you an overall conceptual view of it, right? So why that is a problem, and this is one of the battles I've been getting into with regards to the power law on Twitter, is that the Bitcoin power law theory that Giovanni talks about says that Bitcoin is a physical system. It is, it is all physics. It is all deterministic. Da, 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 da. Okay, fine. Autocorrelation in a deterministic system in and of itself is not a problem. Here's, here's why. Let's use an example that follows a deterministic relationship. And this is one that he uses. 
a falling stone. Okay? The reason why the values, if you were to plot them out, are autocorrelated is because if you hold a stone in your hand and you drop it, you have the speed that the stone is dropping, the time that it takes to fall, and the relationship between the speed and the time that the stone is falling, right? So it stands to reason that as the stone falls in time and space and speed, there's going to be a relationship between those values. That makes perfect sense. And you'll theoretically be able to say that the relationship between the stone and the and the way that it fell is now represented in this in this graph. And yes, the data is order correlated, but this is a deterministic relationship. As the stone falls, it's going to be, have a position in time. It's going to have it's going to have a speed, so on and so on and so forth. Again, very very general. What I'm trying to put across, and I could have even refined that a little bit further, but what I'm trying to put across is that is a deterministic relationship. Okay. That is a relationship where you have a set start point, you have a set end point, and you're mapping the relationship between the two. You understand all of the parts in that relationship. What is deterministic about Bitcoin? Remember, this is a price model here, okay? What is deterministic about Mt. Gox, 3 hours capital, BlockFi, Sam Beckman fried the China ban on Bitcoin mining, BitConnect, I can go on and on and on. What is deterministic in Bitcoin's price data that tells you that would have happened? How is the Bitcoin power law accounting for this? The answer is they aren't. So the argument I keep getting into is that you are treating Bitcoin as a physical system, as a deterministic model, which is uh, which is causing you to say if we apply OLS regression, if we apply Durbin Watson, if we apply all of these different statistical estimators on the data, we are accounting for the fact that the data is autocorrelated. Okay. Now again, I'm trying to keep this very very high level. What they're attempting to do is use mathematics and statistics, which are valid measures. I want to be very very clear here. These are valid statistical approaches that they're using on the data. My argument is they are operating under false assumptions and they are not properly understanding the underlying mechanisms of what's driving Bitcoin's price. They cannot tell me to what extent this event or that event impacts Bitcoin's price data. Furthermore, the notion that Bitcoin in Giovanni's case is a physical system doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Here is why. Physical systems are systems that operate under the science, under physics, right? He's saying this physics. So we're thinking about gravity. We're thinking about thermodynamics. We are thinking about those kinds of relationships. Bitcoin is not deterministic because it is human driven. We have network activity that is potentially deterministic or can have deterministic type relationships. We have wallet addresses, right? We can say that there is a relationship between the number of wallet addresses and the, the and Bitcoin's price. We can say there's a relationship between network activity. We can These are all things that can be measured that are physical in nature, that are more deterministic in nature, theoretically, that we can say operate in that fashion. But there's Bitcoin, the asset, there's Bitcoin, the system. Bitcoin, the system is networks, Bitcoin miners, hash rate, all of that. Bitcoin, the asset is human driven, supply and demand, buyers and sellers. Here's why. In all of these aspects here in Bitcoin, the system that works, right? That works very, very seamlessly. We can even say, fine, let's throw in the hashing algorithm. Let's throw in the elliptic curve that secures Bitcoin. Let's throw in everything there in Bitcoin, the system. Over here, Bitcoin, the asset, this is the primary driver of Bitcoin, in my, in my opinion. And I say that for one very simple reason, and here's where, again, I'm trying to talk with you, not at you, as some other individuals might. Remove humans from the world. Remove humans from the system altogether. If there's no one to buy Bitcoin, 
what ha does the price go up does it go down does it do anything i mean without humans probably bitcoin doesn't exist so that's an interesting question uh if if bitcoin now exists and uh, humans uh go extinct uh there's a chance of aliens using it or ai using it or something like that uh, but without aliens and without ai and all those things obviously bitcoin is there to be money between humans and without humans using it, uh, there is no market for Bitcoin. Like there, there will be no price for Bitcoin. There's no US dollar. There's there's nothing else against, like there's nobody valuing it at all. So like without without the uh, aliens picking it up, without AI using it, um, without other creatures finding it and stuff like that, all those things that are, I think it's very unrealistic to happen. Um, I would say then there is not even a, market for bitcoin so there's obviously also no price and no movement on stuff like that correct not only would there be if there are no humans to buy there's no supply and demand there um is no general market sentiment that would drive supply and demand there's no one to use it and it seems like a, a an extreme example but i have to use it in order to illustrate why the physical system model doesn't make sense take humans out of the system altogether. And, and I'm just talking about Bitcoin, the asset here. The, there's, there's no one to use it. There's no one to exchange it. There's no one to send it. There's no one to receive it. There's no use for it. The, the system it's, is not just going to magically start sending Bitcoin back and forth from wallets um, via some form of, I don't know, physical osmosis or something, right? It's not going to happen. So with that being said, if you have Bitcoin the system, you have Bitcoin the asset, any predictive model must account for Bitcoin the system and Bitcoin the asset. What they're attempting to do is saying Bitcoin is a system, therefore everything is mathematically determinable and understandable. Therefore, we are using mathematical and statistical modeling to validate our theses. Therefore, we are operating under the, the understanding and the assumption that if we operate with this statistical estimator and this statistical um, evaluation and we do these out of samplings and we do etc 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 we are accounting for autocorrelation but they are not so coming back to the point of autocorrelation if you do not understand what is driving the bitcoin price which they do not because we cannot say for certain we cannot say for certain what is driving the price of anything there are too many factors you cannot account for those if you are not accounting for the fact that Bitcoin is a social human system as well as a physical one, not just a physical one, if you are not accounting for the reality of potential black swan events, if you are not accounting for the reality of um, potential um, positive events, as in Apple and Dell and Google and Meta on the same day all announced we're putting Bitcoin in a balance sheet in a value of 10 billion each, the price is going to explode to the upside, right? So you need to account for the, the black swans and you need to account for what I would call a white swan, right? That will be a white swan event where it is incredibly positive. If you cannot account for all of those factors, if you cannot realistically and reliably model for all of those factors in the data, you are not predicting anything. What you are doing is you fit a line to historical data, you are now projecting that line into the future, and you're assuming that that what caused the price action in the past will persist into the future. What they're doing is little more than me opening Instagram and scrolling and seeing my sun sign horoscope. There's no real rigor to it in what they are attempting to do. And I don't even mean to say that to insult astrologers, because even astrologers use multiple data points. They're using one, price, maybe two, time. But time is an independent variable. Time will move regardless of price. So we have to take that out, out of the equation. They're using one single data point, looking in the past, projecting it into the future, and claiming it as predictive. Even with that said, in conversations and arguments with these individuals, and I've seen other conversations on Twitter and I've seen in other video interviews that they've done, a lot of the proponents of this model have admitted the model will break at some point, but they cannot say when. The model cannot predict 
exactly when a price will occur. The model is openly, they admit, based on historical data. So we now have a model that is claiming to be predictive. And let's just all say it all out so far of what we have. They don't account for the human factor. They don't account for the social factor. They cannot reliably say to what extent any of those factors impact the data that they're looking at. They cannot predict into the future how these things would impact the data that they're looking at. They're looking at historical data that is autocorrelated, that is inherently biased, and they are also admitting that the model will break at some point in the future, but the predictive, the predictive model that is supposed to predict the outcome of Bitcoin within a certain range cannot predict when it would fail. So the predictive model can't predict when it would fail, and the predictive model can't predict the extent to where these factors impact the price of Bitcoin. So again, I ask you, what is it predicting? It's a, it's a hell of a good question. <laughs> I, w I would love to see a, a debate between you and Giovanni or something like that. It would, it would be an interesting thing. If he would stop insulting me and calling me names and um, being very, very hostile as possible. But um, what, and this is where I, I would, I, I perhaps would seem biased. What, what, a separate, what separates me from other individuals in the space, and this is something I'm very, very proud of, I don't have a profit motive. I am very, very successful in my professional life. Bitcoin has made me independently wealthy. I do not have the need to sell you a Patreon talking about the power law. I do not have a need to sell you a Patreon talking about against the power law. I am not trying to sell you a book. I am not trying to sell you a membership. I am not trying to tell you, follow me and pay me this dollar amount so I can show you when to sell Bitcoin in the future based on the power law. I am giving this information out for free. My only motive is to tell people to be very, very wary of individuals attempting to predict the future and also to be very, very wary of individuals that are so blatantly hostile towards anyone that challenges that narrative. Because I, for the, for the very first time, spoke about the power law back in March. And any time since then I've mentioned the power law, I get attacked by Giovanni, by others. And the other question I bring up to people is, if this model is so statistically valid, if it is so sound, if it is so profound, there would not be the need to attack. So I urge people to be very, very cautious of who they believe in. And I urge people to be very, very cautious of what decisions they make based on that decision. Also, I urge people to realize that being an astrophysicist or being a PhD does not mean that you are more intelligent than the population. It is a function of time. So with that said, I'll also bring up this other nugget. The first argument that I had about the power law was that it was a statistical model. I was told directly by multiple proponents of this, of this theory that it has, quote, nothing to do with statistics. While all of the validation, all of the um, evidence that they presented for the power law is statistical. I say that because I'm urging you and I'm urging others to challenge this narrative. The power law is useful. It is descriptive. It can be a tool in another um, model where we have a more holistic view that does take the social aspects of Bitcoin into play. But I think it is very dangerous and is very, very harmful to tell people in the community, sell your Bitcoin based on this power law that will be at this price or this price, or maybe this price, maybe this price, or this price at this time in the future. We can't tell you when, but maybe you should sell it then. Because people are actually going to listen to this. And in your example that you gave, someone's going to sell. And then the next day or the next month or something like that, news is going to come out. It's going to explode to the upside and they're going to miss their chance. Now, granted, it is just as likely that it'll explode to the downside as well. Sure. But we should not be trading based on this thing. The ranges are too wide to be useful. It is not statistically useful. It is not beneficial. It is descriptive. And if you are a person that is using it as another tool in your, in your arsenal, I urge you to do that. 
However, there are many people on Twitter, and I've seen them, I've interacted with them, that believe in the validity of the power law, that believe it is useful. They're not promoting it. All they're saying is, this is another tool in my arsenal. And I think it is useful, and I like it because it informs my decisions long term. That I am fine with. Claims of predictability, claims of validity to be a predictive model, that is where I have issue. Really interesting. I, I love it a lot how, how you view it. And I think you, you, you're the first one that shows me in an understandable way um, what my gut feeling to, to, <laughs> gut feeling told me about the power law. <laughs> I, I especially love the one point with uh, it's it's only based on one data point. Uh, I think that's that's the main thing. Like you just like look at the price and then you draw a line in it. It's really interesting. Uh, like I, I would. I would really love to to see the the uh, a debate or something like that. But uh, let's let's come to um, let's come to one uh, to the end routine as we are already very uh, progressed in the time. Um, maybe we I can make it. For that. I've just been talking. Uh, no, no, no worries, no worries. Uh, it's 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 been really great. Like I think you laid out the power law and a really balanced view to that in an amazing way. And, uh, it's, 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 it's such a bad thing. If like, I love debates, but mo most of them, they, they get emotional. And, and then it's like, I, I don't like that. Like if it's, it gets emotional or it gets like even harmful to each other, that's not what, what, what I, I like. And most debates for some reason, uh, go in that, that direction. So I, I can understand. Um, Perfect. Then let's get to the end routine where I have two questions. The first question is always the same question for everyone. What can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? Oh, wow. Um, I would say that I am a person that enjoys learning. And as such, I like sharing information, which is what kind of motivated me to um, do this, this on podcast. I would say that I am a firm believer in the future. I do think that we have a bright future ahead of us, despite the fact that, you know, if you look at the political landscape, if you look at um, different things, it can seem daunting, but I, I am a firm believer that we are heading towards a brighter future. Um, with that said, I think that a informed population is a fundamentally more sound population, which is why, again, I'm a, a big advocate in sharing information. Um, Besides that, I think that um, I like to think of myself as an approachable person. I like to think of myself as a honest person. I like to think of myself as a fair person. And I take that approach through everything that I do. And if there's one thing that I would like um, people to know about me, if I had to dumb that down to one simple thing, is that I pride myself on challenging my assumptions, learning, adapting, and growing my knowledge base. I guess that's the best way I can describe myself on t uh, based on what I do in Twitter and what, based on what I do in my prof professional life. I'm trying to find a way to, to like juxtapose them both. Interesting, really cool. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that input. I, I, I love it a lot. Um, we have an end, the, the other end routine where is where the, the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And the question is an interesting one. Um, if we um, assume that Bitcoin will win and Bitcoin is, is the, the dominant thing, how do we make sure that we as Bitcoiners win? Um, we as Bitcoiners will, could win or will win in that, in that example by staying true to the ethos of what Bitcoin is. Now, that can be um, different based on the Bitcoiner. Some people are very, very strong in the gold 2.0 camp. Some people are very, very strong in the medium of exchange camp, what have you. I bring that up to say that I think Bitcoiners win by using our collective political capital to implement change. So I do think we need to be a more vocal voting block. I do think we need to be a more vocal knowledge block, kind of like, and, and, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but that is why I'm trying to share information as much as possible. I think we should try to share information with the public as much as possible. I think that, um, keeping Bitcoin true to its decentralized, immutable um, nature is key. 
we should actively try to Im um, impede anyone that tries to co-opt it. We should make sure that we hold institutional players accountable. We should also make sure that just because we've won and we've established Bitcoin as the predominant currency, the predominant store of value, what have you, that does not mean the job is done. We have to make sure that us winning actually helps the world, right? So I'm sure you've heard, fix the money, fix the world. If we've won, I think that means we've fixed the money, right? So now that we've fixed the money, in this example, we have to fix the world. And, and that is where all these other factors, I think, come into play. It was such a pleasure talking with you, Adrian. I think um, it will definitely not be your last podcast. <laughs> I think you're really interesting. And, and uh, I, I definitely want to, to have you on again. Uh, and I probably, I, I guess you will be on other podcasts also, uh, if, if other podcasters see that. Um, really cool. Thank you so much uh, for, for giving us the time. Before I let you go, where can people find you and ask your questions? Well, just look for me on Twitter. I am at Adrian underscore R underscore Morris on Twitter. And that's the best place to find me. I try to keep uh, my professional life and my Twitter Bitcoin life separate. But um, I, if you have questions, um, if you want to know anything more, if you have um, feedback, comments, concerns, reach me there. I'm very open to feedback and comments, and I look forward to speaking with whoever reaches out to me. Thank you so much, uh, Adrian, for, for being on with us. Uh, also, thank you so much for everyone that's watching and listening, for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.